Okay, today's Torah portion is what? Kitavo, which means when you come. So let's look at Deuteronomy 26, 1 and 2. And it shall be Kitavo into the Eretz, the land which the Lord your God, what? Gives you. I mean, how many of you know land costs money? How about an entire nation? How much would it cost to buy all the land of Israel if you were to go and buy it from somebody? And it says the Lord is just going to give it to you for what? An inheritance. Now, that's a very important word, inheritance, because it's, it's a little bit different word. Some things you get, you can resell. Someone gives you something, you get something from grandma or grandpa, and you go and you can sell it or something. Well, this is something that's not to be sold. This is an inheritance that belongs to you. And you, wait a minute, if it's an inheritance, that means who did it come from? God. So when you realize the land of Israel, matter of fact, the whole earth belongs to God. And the Bible says he gave land allotments to every nation. And that's why when they went into Israel, don't touch that. That's Lot's land. Don't touch that. That's Esau's land. Don't touch that. That's Moab's land. And he says, your land that I've allotted to you is here. Only God can give the land. But isn't it nice? Isn't he a nice God? He didn't sell it to him. He didn't make him work for it. He says, I'm just going to give it to you. And you're going to live in it. And he says, you will take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which you will bring of your land that the Lord your God, what? Gives you again, and I want you to put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place, Makom, that's one of the names of God, to the very place which the Lord your God will choose to place his name there. Now, can you imagine the battle? Oh, God's going to place his name there. Every tribe would say, place it here in my tribe. No, no, place it here in my tribe. But God decided to put the temple where, in Jerusalem where he put it, but notice, they could not choose the place. I'm giving you this land, and this is, so even though God gave it to them, he still owns it. Just like you pick a bedroom for one of your kids. It's their room, but it's really your room. You following me? Okay. And who do inheritance typically go to but family? That's amazing that he says that only with Israel. He doesn't say it with the other nations. Now, can you give away something that is not yours? But here's the problem. With many farmers, after working on their field for an entire season, day in and day out, the farmer could very well feel that the success of his crops belongs entirely to all of his hard work rather than needing any assistance from God. They don't realize God provided the sun, God provides the rain, you know. Uh, and so all of a sudden they think the land is theirs first, but it's not theirs first. It's God's first, which is why they have to bring the first fruits. Wow. Now, <clears throat> what the farmer is declaring by doing this is that he is understanding that God is not only the driver at the helm of history, but he's also the source of his own personal bounty. So the whole earth belongs to God. And that's why to the atheist who thinks everything just happened, he says, okay, fine, you go get your own dirt though, and let's see what you can do. You can't use any of my dirt. <laughs> And so this is where the whole idea of first fruits, it's like God says, okay, I give you 10 pennies and I want one back. The whole reason of giving the one back is not because God needs the penny. He doesn't. He wants you to acknowledge that you have a boss. Now, I think this is a pretty good trait. <laughs> I mean, anyone investing, wow. I get nine and only have to give them one. That's a pretty good investment. 
But most people don't think of it that way, and they, they want it all. And this is the problem of all of history. Everybody wanted everything for themselves. The ultimate narcissist. So let's look at Deuteronomy 26, verse 3 and 4. It says, you're to go to the priest that'll be in those days and say to him, now this is a profession of their mouth, and they have to say, I profess this day unto the Lord that I am come into the country which the Lord swore to give to our fathers, and the priest will take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. So the farmer who works the promised land has to testify that God's promises are true. When they came out of Egypt, they said, you just bought us out to kill us. That's what they said. And God says, no, I brought you out so I could bring you in. And so from all the rest of history, whenever they come, they have to bring their first fruits. Why was Cain's offering not acceptable? You know, some people think because it was a grain. No, grains have always been acceptable. It wasn't the first fruits. All right. He gave the garbage. That is why Cain's wasn't acceptable. It says that Abel gave the best. There's a lot of different words for fat. There's good fat and bad fat, okay? <laughs> and the Abel brought the best, the first fruits. Cain wanted to save the best for himself, so he didn't bring the best. That was the problem with his offering. And uh, what's amazing is, because everyone had to be in Jerusalem for the feast, every little town all over Israel, everyone would gather together and they would travel as a group. People didn't necessarily go on their own. It was a festive time. There also was danger, you know, with the different Canaanites that were still in the land. So they would all come together and then they would all sing and dance and rejoice while they're going to Jerusalem. Now, look at Deuteronomy 26.10. It says, And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land. All right. Reshit is the first fruits. It is the word reshit, which means it's the first in place, the first in time, the first in order or rank. And in other words, if it's first, it is the beginning, right? That is why. When you add the letter bait, you have Bereshit, which means in the beginning. It's the first word of the Bible. It's the first in rank. It's the first in order. And Messiah was the first fruit offering from the ground in the promised land of Israel. Think of it. He said, unless a grain of wheat falls on the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it falls on the ground and dies, what does it do? It brings forth a lot of fruit. He was the first seed that was buried in the ground. All the first fruits that were being given before Messiah came was a type of the Messiah who became the first fruits. Look at John 12, 24. <clears throat> verily, verily, I say to you, except a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And this is why the Lord wants us to bring forth. We have to bring forth fruit. And the more fruit we bring, that shows the more we're tied into the Messiah. The less fruit we bring, the less close we're tied to the Messiah. Life is all about relationships. How close do you want to be? And that's why I'd like to say the Torah is likened unto water, the oceans that cover the sea. Do you just want to sit on the beach and dip your toes in it? Uh, do you want to go swimming in it? Do you want to go out in a boat out in the middle of it? Do you want to snorkel? Do you want to scuba dive? Everybody has a relationship with God in some way, all believers. But the thing is, how deep is the relationship? How deep do we want to go with this? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, it says the Messiah has risen from the dead and he's become the first fruits of those that slept. Leviticus 23, 10 it says, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I'm giving you and you reap the harvest, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits. And that sheaf represents the Messiah. Look at this. Here we go. This is uh, what is amazing. This is that first word, bear a sheet, as you can see. 
But the letters B, R, Beit Resh is bar, as in bar mitzvah. <clears throat> and you find in Daniel 3.25, that is translated as the word son. And in Genesis 41.49, it's translated as the word grain when Joseph is gathering grain. So that same word can be son or it can be grain. Well, the son is the grain that was planted into the ground to become the first fruits. So here we see Reshit is first fruits in both Leviticus 23.10 and in 1 Corinthians 15.20. And what's amazing, uh, that word right there, a sheet, after consulting with the master Hebrew <laughs> scholar, Danny Ben Gigi, it basically means I'll lay a foundation. And how many of us know Messiah is the foundation that God has laid? Everything is there. Let me see. Okay. Here's the other thing. <clears throat> oh, I don't have it here. But this is uh, the place, a Messiah. He rises from the dead and becomes the first fruit. Now watch this here. Let me go. In Psalms 30, what's really important is to know, customarily, the Levites would always sing Psalms 30 on the Feast of First Fruits. On the Feast of First Fruits, they're singing Psalms 30, and guess what? Psalms 30 speaks of the death and the resurrection of the Messiah who rose on first fruits. Psalm 30, verse 1, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and you've not made my foes to rejoice over me. Verse 3, O Lord, you brought up my soul from the grave. You kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. And so when they came to the Temple Mount, they would lift up their baskets on their shoulders as they entered into the court then the priest would lay their hands under each basket. Together, they would wave the baskets in all four directions in order to demonstrate that they belong to God. The baskets were then placed by the altar. And the following text from our Torah portion is what they read. So when they brought the first fruits, listen to what they would have to say in 8 through 11. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, an outstretched arm, great terribleness, with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and has given us this land, even a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I brought the first fruits of the land, which you, O Lord, have given me. Do you see how it's all acknowledging as him being the source? And then it says, and you will set it before the Lord and worship before the Lord and you shall rejoice. That's a command. You have to rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given you and unto your house, you, the Levite, and the stranger that is among you. If you don't bring any first fruits, what you're saying to the Lord is, you sure have been bad to me. I, you didn't help me. Uh, wow, you didn't keep your promises. But God fulfills his promises. It's being thankful. For, not only that, it's being thankful at first fruits for the entire process of their history from the Exodus. Just like when we do Passover, we have to imagine as if we were there. It was a lie. Well, it's the same thing with the first fruits. They have to include Israel's suffering of exile, the miracle of redemption, the ingathering into the land. And it emphasizes the fact that the Exodus really wasn't fully completed when they arrived at Sinai. It's only when they entered the land, took possession, formed, farmed it, that the process is truly completed. Then the nation was truly free to worship God. Now you know God literally gave everything to Adam and Eve. Everything. He kept back only one tree for himself so they would recognize there was a boss, there was a benefactor who they were accountable to. But also so they would realize God wanted to deepen the relationship with them just as a parent does when bestowing gifts upon a child. How many of you know parents sometimes don't want to bestow a gift upon a child because they think they will ruin themselves or it? All right. Now look at Deuteronomy 26, 16 through 19. It says, today the Lord your God commanded you to do these statutes and judgments. Therefore, you shall keep and do with all your heart, with all your soul, 
And you have today said that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in his ways, keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and listen, hear and obey his voice. And then it says, and the Lord has taken you today to be his weird kids. <laughs> As he promised you to keep his commandments and it's to make you high above all the nations that he's made in praise and in name and in honor that you can be a holy people to the Lord your God as he's spoken. I think it's interesting. You keep hearing the word today and you're going to hear that in the book of Hebrews and in Deuteronomy 27, 9 and 10. Moses and the priests and the Levites spoke to all of Israel and they said, take heed and listen, O Israel. Today you become the people of the Lord your God. Therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God. Do his commandments, his statutes, I command you today. Wow, how often does a boss tell you, I want you to do what God says? Or is that always, I want you to do what I tell you. I command you, you have to do it. And at the same time, they don't recognize there's a boss over them. But here is what is amazing. Look what happens. In Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2, it'll come to pass if you will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all of his commandments I'm commanding you this day. The Lord your God will set you on high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings will come on you and overtake you. Wow, here's a tsunami. How many of you would like to face a tsunami like what happened, you know, over there in Indonesia? You know, all of a sudden it's just, but what if that was a tsunami of blessings? Bring it on, <laughs> you know. That would be so overwhelming, but God wants to bring us a tsunami of blessings. How many of you choose the blessings? Hello. But... Watch what happens in 8 and 9. He says, the Lord will command the blessing. Can you imagine? He goes, blessing, I command you. Go upon Danny. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to, yes, bring it on. <laughs> and then uh, it says, uh, hail, the Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and everything you set your hand to do. And he's going to bless you in the land the Lord God gives you. He's going to establish you to be a holy people as he's sworn. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Wow. So here we have this scale and there's 12, 12 powerful verses of blessings where God just wants to overcome you. Look at Deuteronomy 28, 13. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you will be above only. You will not be beneath. If you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, I command you this day to observe and do them. Now, how many of you in Christianity have ever heard that prayer? I'll make you the head and not the tail. Oh, but for heaven's sake, don't do the commandments of the Lord your God so that it happens. <laughs> Hello. Well, this has been done away with. Well, if it's been done away with, why are you praying be the head and not the tail? Wow. Okay, look at Deuteronomy 28, 15. It'll come to pass if you don't hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to observe to do all these commandments and the statutes I command you this day, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. How'd you like that big tsunami wave be curses? I don't think so. And then look at verse 45 and 47. All these curses will come on you and they'll even pursue you and overtake you until you're destroyed because you didn't obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and statutes that he commanded you. They will be a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring forever because, now here's what's mind blowing. I'm serious, this is, you gotta catch this. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things. Wow, you could, God, I did everything you said. Oh, but you didn't do it with the right attitude. So you can actually keep all the commandments and be cursed because you didn't do it joyfully. I can't help but think of this guy right here. I did what you said. <laughs> you know. God says, I don't want you to just do what I said. I want you to like it. I want you to love it because of 
all the abundance. So God gives us all the abundance and we won't even give him one penny out of 10. You know, uh, how do, uh, we're telling God, you hadn't blessed me. And so look what happens. How many of you know there are some people who serve God begrudgingly? I know before I was a believer in the Catholic Church, man, I hated to go to church. I got to go to church. I went to church, though, because, uh, you know, I felt I was in big trouble if I didn't. Okay, so. um, We have to see the Torah not as some rule book intended to wear us down and, you know, make us feel like we're slaves or something. The Torah is not some dry, dusty rule of law, and our purpose in life is not to just get a passing grade for following the rules. How often do so many people, they just want to get a passing grade. They don't want to excel. Well, look at Deuteronomy. Here we come, 27, verse 25 through 26. Cursed is he that takes a reward to kill somebody. How many know that still happens today? Give me some money and I'll go kill him for you. Well, guess what? I have good news. You're not under the law. That doesn't apply to you today. Pretty dumb, huh? Okay. Cursed be he that confirms not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people will say amen. Here's a verse that's very misunderstood. In Galatians <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 10, as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continues not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Okay, wait a minute. Well, that just tells you that Deuteronomy 27, 25, 26 doesn't apply anymore. No, it doesn't mean we can now hire hitmen to take out people we don't like. Okay, <laughs> so you have to understand the Torah was to protect us. And that's what God wants us to understand. Matter of fact, let's look at Deuteronomy 27, 19 through 24. Cursed be he that perverts judgment of the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and all the people will say, amen. Cursed be he that lies with his father's wife because he uncovers his father's skirt, and all the people will say, amen. Cursed be he that lies with any man or beast, and all the people will say, amen. And it just goes on and on. So do we, we're not under the law. We can do these now and joyfully. What? See, this is where people don't understand the whole concept. Uh, none of these are in the Ten Commandments, but for heaven's sake, the blessings are a part of the same law-giving principles. If you do away with all the curses, you've got to do with all, away with all the blessings. They go together. They both come from the law. Now, God did redeem us from the curse, maybe not from the law, Okay, but that's if we turn and we repent, not if we do not turn and repent. Deuteronomy 29, 19, and 20. <clears throat> It'll come to pass, and now this is the heaviest ones for Christians to get. It'll come to pass when whoever hears the words of this curse blesses himself in his heart, saying, well, I'm going to have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart, because I've got Jesus in my pocket. Okay, that's the concept. Uh, it says to add drunkenness to thirst. Look what happens to that person. The Lord will not spare him. The anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that person. All the curses that are written in the book will lie upon him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Anyone who thinks, oh, you know, oh, uh, I can do all of these horrible things now because Jesus covered it. <laughs> uh, he, you know, he's forgiving you so you don't do it again. He's not giving you a license to continue doing it. Look at Galatians 3.11. No one is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Guess what? Everybody knows you can't be justified by the law. Just as I've said many times, if I get stopped for a speeding ticket, I can't go, well, look at how many times I didn't speed. He doesn't care. We've all broken the law so we all are under the curse regardless. And what the Lord wants to do is get us to stop doing those things. He does not, this is a very important statement. He does not want to save you in your sins. He wants to save you from your sins. From your sins. The problem is with 
man, we love our sin too much. We don't want to be safe from our sins. We just want to be safe from the consequence of our sin. It doesn't work that way. Matter of fact, this whole concept comes from the Tanakh. Look at Habakkuk 2.4. Behold, his, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. Why? Because the just have to live by his faith. Very important, by his faith. Okay, so in conclusion, he was saying that no one can rely on their justification before God based on their ability in keeping the commandments because we all fail. We're all justified by faith. Our obedience is not to be done out of self-righteousness, but because we love the Father. So here we have all of these 53 powerful verses of curses. So we've got to decide, uh, are we going to choose the blessing or are we going to choose the cursing? Now I'm going to wrap this up real quick because this is very prophetic in Deuteronomy 28, 29. Listen to what it says. You will grope at noon day as the blind gropes in darkness. Can you imagine at noon is when the sun is at its brightest, but this is prophesying at some point in time, it's going to become pitch black at noon. Look at Matthew 27, 45. From the sixth hour, which is noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. So here's the thing. This could not be an eclipse. It cannot be a solar eclipse because they only happen on a new moon. Passover is on a full moon. You can only have a lunar eclipse on a full moon and lunar eclipses are at night, not during the day. It can't be an eclipse. Not only that, a total solar eclipse lasts about five minutes. This is three hours. So this is something completely miraculous. But here, what do we see? It was at noonday that everything turned black as Messiah was lifted up. Matthew 27, 51 through 53. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks went, and the graves were open. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now look at Amos 8, 9, and 10. It'll come to pass in that day, says the Lord, I will cause the sun to go down when? This is the prophesy of Messiah's death, a prophecy. I will darken the earth in the clear day, and I will turn Passover into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring upon sackcloth on all loins, baldness upon every head. I will make it as the mourning of an only son. This is God's son. This is a prophecy about the Messiah who will be the son of God and the end of will be a better day. Now the Hof Torah, I'll go real quick. Isaiah 60, look at this. Darkness will cover the earth, gross darkness, the people. Darkness isn't always lack of light. It's lack of morals, a moral darkness as well. And then it says the Gentiles are going to come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Verse five, then you will see flow together. Your heart will fear be enlarged because the abundance of the sea or the nations will be converted to you. The forces of the Gentiles are coming to you. The Jews are not coming to the Christians. The Christians are going to the Jews. Wow. Isaiah 60, 11 and 12. Therefore, your gates will be open continually. They'll not be shut day or night. So men will bring unto you the forces of the Gentiles that their kings may be brought the nation and kingdom that won't serve you will perish and those nations will be utterly destroyed. May that be in our day. Verse 14, the last verse here. The sons also of them that afflicted you are going to come bending unto you. All that despised you will bow themselves down at the soles of your feet and they're going to call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. So what do we see? Gentiles turning to Torah is the current prophetic move of this day, and those who do will be noted forever as the first fruits of Zion. You are the first fruits of Zion in fulfillment of this prophecy. So who wants to get on board? Yay! Get on the boat before it closes. Let's stand. Avinu Mokeno, our Father King, we just thank you so much for everything you're doing in all of our lives. 
Father, I pray you would give us all hearing ears, eyes to see, heart to understand what you're saying to all of us. Father, we just thank you so for all of those who want to magnify your Torah, make it honorable once again, and restore its authenticity of the language, the context. Father, and I just pray for all of those who give into your kingdom through El Shaddai Ministries, who wants to take the light of the Torah to all the nations of the earth. We thank you so much for all the tithes and offerings and the blessings, because it's all about you. We just want to bless you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay, now, drum roll. Here we are, Song of Songs, which is really about us returning to God as our king. Now, here we go. This is a play, as I told you, to help us really understand it. And we are still in Acts 4, and we're going to cover chapter 5, verse 3, through chapter 6, verse 10. And this is all about the body of Messiah, his kids, finally go through what is called a true repentance, and then it's a heartfelt search. You remember last week when I was talking about how he's standing at the door, he's really just beating at the door, pounding, and she was asleep. The door is locked. It is barred. So let's watch what happens. Here we see in chapter 5, verse 3, what does she say? Here he's begging her to open the door. And she goes, I've taken off my robe. Must I put it back on? Well, I've washed my feet. Do you want me to come out there and get my feet dirty? <laughs> and so look what she says. My beloved thrust his hand in through the latch opening. Oh, my heart pounded for him. Here she's sounding like she just loves him so much but she didn't want to get up and get her feet dirty or put her robe on. There's a lot of people that profess all this love for God, but they don't do anything he says. And so she goes, look at this. She arose to open for her beloved, but she had to get ready first. My hands were dripping with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. She was not eagerly looking out the window, anticipating his return. She wasn't outside anticipating his return. She's in bed, the door locked and barred, so nobody could even get in to hear the good news. And so she says, I open for my beloved. But my beloved turned away. He was gone. Oh, my heart leaped up when he spoke. Oh, I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. This is why in Luke 12, in the parable of the virgins, but the men's version, not the women's version, it says, blessed is the one who opens the door immediately when I knock. Immediately. There are going to believers, be believers and go through the tribulation because they don't answer the door immediately when he knocks. So she not only wasn't out working the harvest with the shepherd, she wasn't even at the window eagerly looking for his return. And guess what? He came to his kids or his bride totally unexpected. She not only wasn't working the harvest, he has the door locked so no one could come in to hear the good news. Four times she calls him her beloved. She claims to love him as he speaks, yet her love is totally self-serving. That's the difference. Her love is totally self-serving. Many so-called believers today are actually what I call God stalkers. Just like people stalk movie stars. Oh, and they claim to love that movie star. But the movie star thinks they're stalking them. It's not returned. It's narcissism. It's always about you. And this is the problem with the body of Messiah. That's what this is saying. They stop God and profess a love for him, but it's only because of what he can do for them 
in supplying some existential need that they want. They don't love God for who he is or else they would obey him. If you love me, you will obey me. I also can't help but think of the church of Laodicea who's caught up with all the blessings and doesn't realize she's in total poverty. She hears the shepherd's voice but is disturbed by what he has to say. What do we find in the Laodicean church? Okay, so first off, here's the door. It's locked. It's barred. Well, I want you to think of the door of the church. Here comes Messiah knocking at the door. Everyone knows this verse, Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come to him. I will sup with him and he with me. Guess what? Everyone use that verse for salvation. If he comes to your heart, you know, he's knocking at the door of your heart. Repent and be saved. No, he's knocking at the door of the church. And they're in there having church without him. And he's out there saying, hey, I'm out here. And they're saying, leave us alone. We're having church. They don't even know he left. Just like in the Song of Songs where the Messiah is knocking at the door of his house, he's calling out to the bride to come out and spend time with him. And so this church also finds him knocking at the door. He's standing at the door of the church and they don't even realize he'd left long ago. They're too busy being seeker friendly. They just want to be a life coach. All right. Uh, they don't even know God is outside asking them to come out where he is. They're too caught up with religion and not a relationship. So here it is. This is the verse I was talking about. Luke 12, 35 and 36, it says, let your loins be girded about, your life's burning, and be like a men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding. Do you realize they don't go to go to the wedding of the Messiah? Here's people that go through the tribulation. They don't get to go through the wedding. But this time it says, when he comes back from the wedding, when he comes and knocks, they may open immediately. That's what I was talking about. The church doesn't know God's calendar. They don't... They, it, he will come to them unexpectedly. When you know the calendar, you know the times and the seasons, and you answer immediately. But here will be part of the church that has to go through the tribulation because they don't answer immediately. So what happens? Here she is. She's searching for him again, and we see he's gone. So let's look at Psalm 32, verse 5 and 6. Here it says, I acknowledged my sin unto you and my iniquity I have not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto you in a time when you may be found. There are times and seasons when he will be found and when he won't be found. And what month are we in right now? which is the month he may be found. This is when the king is in the field, right before Rosh Hashanah. He's going through the wheats and the tares. This is the season to call upon God. This is the season he is near. Okay, so the ones that are godly know when he may be found. The, uh, let me look at this. This is why you have to be on God's calendar. This is why we produced last year, this is one of them's last year's calendar, one of them is this year's calendar, so you can know the times and seasons. We combined the biblical calendar with the Gregorian calendar, and this latest one, where the heavens declare the glory of God, goes all the way to 2026. So you can look and know the times and the seasons when God is near. Look at Proverbs 1, 24 through 31. How many of you, when you call on the Lord, want him to answer you? Anybody? Well, guess what? It's very easy to have that happen. All you have to do is answer when he calls you. If you answer when he calls you, guess what? He'll answer when you call him. Look at Proverbs 1, 24 through 31. Because I've called... And you refuse to answer. I stretched out my hand and no one even regarded. You have said at nothing all my counsel. You would have none of my reproof. Therefore, I'm going to laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. 
When your fear comes as a desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then you will call upon me, but I won't answer. They'll seek me early, but they're not going to find me. Those are scary verses. This tells you, you got to get on God's calendar and you have to answer when he calls. If you want him to answer when you call. Wow. Wow. They'll even seek him early, but won't find me. Did you know Jeremiah was living during the time of the destruction of the temple? Three times God told Jeremiah, don't pray for Israel. Don't pray for Israel. Don't even pray for them. It's, it's like they've gone over the cliff. It's too late. And it, it says here, then shall you call upon me. I will not answer. You'll seek me early. You won't find me. For that they hated knowledge, they did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel, they despised my reproof, therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Wow. But guess what? You see scripture after scripture after scripture that supports this concept. Just like in this morning's Torah portion, a lot of blessings if you obey, a lot of curses if you don't obey. Look at Zechariah 7, which speaks of the last days that we're in. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah, and it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, execute true judgment, show mercy and compassion everyone to his brother. Don't oppress the widow or the fatherless, the stranger nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Now, is that all done away with? I don't think so. But they refused to hearken. They pulled away the shoulder. They stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the Torah. Oh my gosh. And the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. <sighs> Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it's come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear, says the Lord of hosts. I scattered them with the whirlwind among all the nations whom they didn't know. Isn't that amazing? We have to understand God has laws and he has justice, but he's also merciful when you fail if your goal is at least to try to keep the law. So here we see now, let's go back to the Song of Songs. Songs, chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Now, if you remember, the watchman of the city, when they first found her, she finally finds her beloved. But this time, the watchman catch her. Now, the other thing about this, I, I'm not sure exactly what the word for watchman is here in this verse, but uh, note three or the note three refers to Christians. And sometimes I almost wonder if this isn't prophetically speaking about Christians over the last 2000 years. It says the watchman who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. And then it's, he says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, please tell him I'm lovesick. All right. So this time the watchman abuser take away her veil symbolically saying she's no longer committed to anyone. Typically, if the bride was committed to someone, she'd wear a veil and she's not committed. Therefore, they take the veil away from her. And uh, there are some very interesting connections here. Uh, what do we know about the watchman? We, we just read about the watchman. And I always believe to let scripture interpret scripture. I don't want to just tell you what my little fairy tale idea is. Let's look at what the Bible says. Isaiah 56, 10 and 12. His watchmen are blind. I got a nice little picture up here. How would you like to have this person be the watchman? I don't think so. He says they're all, the watchmen are all ignorant. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. How many of you would like this to be your watchdog? It's, it's, no, you don't want a watchdog like that. 
You know, here it says they, they can't even bark. Yes, they are greedy dogs, which never have enough. And now he says they are shepherds who don't understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain. From his own territory, come, one says, I will bring wine and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will just be as today and much more abundant. This is much of the church today. They're fast asleep. They don't see the signs of the times. They think we're not supposed to know and they got their head in the sand. So now, after the Shulamite bride says to the daughters of Jerusalem, and you remember who those are, like the outlying cities, the other people, they say to her, well, what makes your beloved better than any other beloved, oh, fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you are so charging us that we have to go help you find them? And so finally, the Shulamite cries out, from a pure heart of repentance and one of her greatest detailed descriptions, you can really just feel her heart crying. In verse 10 through 16, now this is what we're supposed to be doing. Everyone sees God as Thor, throwing lightning bolts down at the people below. No, we need to describe the Messiah and God like this. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. We're supposed to be telling everyone how wonderful God is, how fantastic he is. Wow, powerful. Now she's talking, and she even declares him as her friend. Well, uh, look at James 2, verse 23. The scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God. It was accounted him for righteousness, and he was called the what? the friend of God. When are we described as, how many of you would like to be like Abraham and be described as a friend of God? How does that happen? John 15, 14, 45. You're my friends if you do what I tell you to do. <laughs> okay. No longer do I call you servants for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all things I've heard from my father. I have made known to you. We're friends of God, but we know what's coming. So now, how do the daughters of Jerusalem respond now? Oh my goodness, in chapter six, verse one, where in the world has he gone, O fairest among women? Where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? So when we tell people how much we love God, that is when the other people want to go seek him with you. If all you do is pour condemnation on people and how they're big fat sinners and they're condemned and they're going to hell, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. You need to just tell them how wonderful God is and how you're seeking him, and then they'll naturally respond to the gospel. That's how it's supposed to be. Because she now confesses the love she has for her beloved before others, not just keeps it to herself locked in a house, now she goes out and confesses it. Uh, when we realize that our relationship with God is not based on religion. This too will have an effect on the lives of others. Uh, the Jewish people, I believe, will soon return to the Lord, confess their love for him, and it will have a tremendous effect on all the nations. Revival never comes with a seeker-friendly approach. It never does. It's because she now confesses the love she has for her beloved before others. Now they also want to seek him. Um, just as in the Song of Songs, we see that everyone's invited to come and eat. God's call is to those who are thirsty, but we have to seek him when he may be found. And I believe very soon we're going to see all the nations running to the Jewish people when the Jewish people return to the Lord. Look at Romans eleven fifteen. If the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what should the receiving of them be but the resurrection? 
the resurrection of the dead, the last days. That's why when Israel returns back to the Lord, then we're going to know that the Messiah is, has opened the door and he's coming in. Where is this event prophesied? Let's look at Zechariah 8, verse 20 and 23. It says, so says the Lord of hosts, there yet will be nations, inhabitants of many cities, and the residents of one will go to another saying, hey, let us go at once to seek favor of the face of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. And many people and strong nations will all come to seek the Lord of hosts. Where? Jerusalem. You know, it's many people don't believe it's the capital of Israel. Well, the time is coming, it's going to be the capital of the whole world. And the Messiah is going to be ruling and reigning. It says, in those days, 10 people out of all languages of the nations will take hold and will seize the skirt of one man, a Jew. And they're saying, we want to go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, I don't know if you guys have done the math. How many of you like math? How many of you hate math? Okay. How many people are going to grab the skirt of the Jew? How many? It, well, let's read it again. In those days, 10 men out of all the languages of the nations will take hold and seize the skirt. So how many? Wrong. There are 70 nations. That's 10 from each 70. That's 700 people. It's 700 to one. We'll be gathering the skirt. Saying, take us with you up to Jerusalem. Isaiah 55, verse 1 through 7. It says, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. What? I can buy this without money? Yeah, it's pretty much free. Come and buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why in the world are you spending money for what isn't bread and your wages for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear, come to me and hear, and your soul will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I've given David as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Surely you will call a nation you don't know, and look at this, and nations who do not know you are going to run to you. Why? Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. He's glorified you. And again, look what it says. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. This is why you got to get on God's calendar so you understand when those times are. Let the wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man is thought. Let him return to the Lord. The month of Elul is the month of return. And they'll have mercy. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon Hosea, again, comes through with a very prophetic insight as to when all of this will happen. We read of how the Lord will tear Judah from the land of Israel. He'll get a hold. Now, I want you to get hold of this the next thought. The Messiah comes from heaven. He goes away. He returns to his place. And he says he's going to stay there until Israel acknowledges their offense and begin to seek his face. Look at Matthew 23, 28, or 30 and 39. The Lord says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. I say unto you, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Adonai. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, so here the Lord says, I am not going to return until Israel repents. That's what he says. Well, guess what? Oh, look. At Hosea 5, verse 14 through 6, 3. I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. That's what happened. 
That's what happened. And he says, no one will be able to rescue them. And then look at what the Messiah says. I will return again to my place. That's heaven. Until they acknowledge their offense. There it is. That's what Matthew was saying. Did they get it from Hosea? The Lord's going to come. He's going to tear here. Uh, Israel was destroyed. They haven't been inhabited or around for 2,000 years. He says, I'm going to go tear. I'm going to go return to my place. And then I'm not going to come back until they, Israel acknowledges what they did. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they'll earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord, they will say. He has torn, but he'll heal us. He has stricken us, but he will bind us up. Now look at this. After two days, he will revive us. Two days is how many years? And how many years has it been since Messiah torn them? 2,000 years. And then what happens? All of a sudden, Israel was revived. Israel came back in 1948. And then on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. The Lord rose on the third day. Symbolically, okay, the nation of Israel, all of humanity will rise on the third millennial day, early in the morning like he did. On the first day of the week, boom, the resurrection of the dead takes place. I mean, we are, and I don't know how many of you realize this, what year is this? We're about to enter 5785. We're 5784. Rosh Hashanah is 5785. Now, you have to know math to really get this, but I think you know it anyway. When do you become two years old? On your second birthday. But actually, you're in your second year the day after your first birthday. You following me? You're not two until you've completed everything. Okay, so if we are in the year 5785, which millennial number are we in? When you hit 5,000, that means you've completed 5,000 years. So if you're 5785, you are 785 years into the sixth day. Everyone following me? We are in the sixth day. Now, you might, I might tell people, guess what? We're about to enter the seventh day. Well, what do you mean? We're only five, seven, eight, four. How can you enter the seventh day? Because five, seven, eight, four is the sixth day. You following me? It's 784 years into the sixth day. Now, the day begins at sunset, not sunrise. We are entering the seventh day right now. We are entering the seventh day. 784 years would be equivalent to like eight o'clock at night of the sixth day, that sunset. We are entering the seventh day right now. And I know many people believe that when he rose from the dead, some believe it was around sunrise, but no, the stone was rolled away. He was already gone. When did he actually rise from the dead? Many believe it was Saturday night, which is actually when the first day of the week begins. So he rose on the first day, but it was after sunset of the Sabbath. That's why he became the first fruits on the first day of the week. And it very well could have been Saturday night because Saturday night begins the first day. If that's the case, the resurrection of the dead could be happening any day now, any time now, we are at the beginning of the seventh day now. And so it says the third day he will raise us up. That's the third millennial day. He will come to us like what? The rain, like the latter and the former rain. The latter rain and the former rain refers to the spring feast and the fall feast. That's all tied to the feast. Wow, he comes to us like the rains. The spring rains speak of Passover and his first coming. The latter rains speak of the fall feast and his second coming. And we see in the Song of Songs, the two times the shepherd appears have to do with the spring and the fall feast. The first time he comes, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away, for lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. That's his first coming. We are now in the Song of Songs prophetically talking about his second coming during the fall feast. 
And in a week, we're going to be entering the full feast. We need to be alert. With that, let's stand. <laughs>